In this session, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 4, and here we have the first serious episode of opposition to the rebuilding project where Nehemiah and the others are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There's been a little foreshadowing along the way that these figures that are named here, Sanballat, Tobiah in particular, will be opposing the Jews. They will be accusing them of false things. They will be trying to discourage them from their project. And it's an opportunity for us to be inspired to have a certain resolve in what God has for us to do, even in the face of external challenges. There will be internal challenges later on that the people of God will have to wrestle with. But in this case, it's very distinctly about dealing with these accusations and these mockers and these people who would try to deter them from what they've set out to do. It begins with Sanballat, verse 1. He, when San, Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heap of rubble, burned as they are? So we get a series of mocking questions. I, I think we can kind of boil down what he's getting at here into a couple dimensions. One is really a question about their capability. Who are these feeble Jews? Who are these people who think that they can do something? This question of their identity, their question, this question of their capability, he goes right at that heart issue. And then he goes on to describe the, the task itself. Perhaps it's too big for them. Perhaps it is too insurmountable of an obstacle for them to overcome. The next verse, verse 3, Tobiah, the Ammonite, speaks up, who was at his side, who was at Sanballat's side. And he says, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down the walls of stone. So he is mocking the work they've already done as, as poor qualities, questioning if it will even last if a little fox were to climb on it, a very lightweight animal when you're talking about a city fortification. And he's saying, look at this, this is pathetic. And so he's really trying to discourage their motivation based on what they've already accomplished. And yet, Nehemiah hears this opposition and continues on, and as he has before, and as he will again, he immediately turns to prayer. Verse 4, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Nehemiah realizes he cannot by himself overcome all the obstacles that might come, he turns to God in prayer. So it says that they did get going. They re rebuilt the wall till it reached half of its height for the people worked with all their heart. So even in the midst of this opposition, they get to work and it begins to go on. And, and it says they prayed and they posted a guard so that they could keep working. The story goes on and these accusers continue to sort of pepper them with threats it says that even actually some of the fellow Jews who started to get discouraged, it says 10 times they came expressing their worries that they would attack. But Nehemiah says, don't, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. But the relentlessness of the accusation, the relentlessness of the threats means that they need to actually put some people on duty. And so it says that they divided up the labor. Half of them would work and half of them would stand guard. But along the way, Nehemiah is a good leader, is encouraging them and says, our God will fight for us. And Nehemiah himself stays vigilant. And the last verse of chapter four says that he and his brothers didn't even take off their clothes and they kept their weapon on their side. Even when they went to go get water, they lived a certain a vigilant resolve that we will stay on alert until this project is done and really modeling a resolve for the people. He said, we didn't even get cozy for the night and, and sleep in more comfortable clothes, but we kept our work clothes on. We kept our day clothes on until the project was done. As I mentioned before, but just a reminder here, it's a 52 day project. Setbacks along the way, di distraction and, and discouragement along the way, but 52 days and they will see this thing through. So 
Nehemiah models a resolve in the face of opposition. He again turns to prayer. And as we've said before, and we'll want to continue to say along the way, how does this text help us consider the ultimate restoration that Christ will bring about? Well, if Nehemiah had to face opposition, Jesus had to face even more. Jesus was accused over and over again of not being who, in fact, he was, the Son of God. I think of this accusation from Sanballat, who are these feeble Jews? And I think of the devil's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness where he kept saying, if you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. You can do that. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself off the, the temple and it will, and God will send his angels to care for you. If you're the Son of God. Even when we think about the, the scene of the crucifixion, the religious leaders, and even one of the criminals that is being crucified with him, heap insults on him. And they say, if you're really the Messiah, save yourself. You've claimed all this, these times that you would be able to deliver God's people, that you are the savior of the world. Show it. Come down from the cross and we'll believe in you. And the criminal saying, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and us. Prove it. And in the face of that temptation, Jesus did not violate his mission and give in to a temptation to somehow prove that he is who he claims he is. There was a certain settled resolve. He understood who he was. He knew who his father said he was. He, at the baptism, at the transfiguration, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He trusted the affirmation of his father, and that gave him a resilience in the face of accusations, questions, doubts from others about who he is. When we look at these other accusations that he's not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to re rebuild this wall. It's too insurmountable. You can't do it. Your, the quality of your work is not good enough. Jesus knew that he would be able to, to see success on the other side. He knew Psalm 16, where it says, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. He knew that on the other side of death was resurrection. And Every accusation he faced is not even as significant as that experience of death, but yet even death could not hold him. Psalm 16, you're, you, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Peter quotes that text in Acts chapter 2, reflecting back on the crucifixion and resurrection as a confirmation that we know Jesus is in fact the Messiah. That question of if he's the Messiah, his resurrection actually is the thing that proves it. But if Jesus didn't see that through, if he didn't go through the cross, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill and accomplish that ultimate declaration of victory through the resurrection. And so in the face of questions about an insurmountable obstacle called death, he trusted in the resurrection. And in terms of the quality of his work, in terms of if this wall that they're going to rebuild is going to be able to even hold the weight of a fox, Jesus faced questions, even sometimes from his own disciples, of the nature of his kingdom. Is this kingdom really going to be anything impressive? After Jesus fed the 5,000, it says that the people wanted to make him king by force. They wanted him to be set up as a king like they would expect, a king that kicks out all the enemies, kicks out the Roman Empire, kicks out the Herod family from the, the temple compound. But Jesus says, I, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, yes, that's how we would fight. When Jesus is in his discussion with Pilate, that's in fact what he says. If my kingdom was from this world, my servants would fight to defend me so that way I couldn't be arrest, arrested. But my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of, of a different type. And so the effectiveness of his kingdom, he knew, looked a lot different than the kingdoms of this world. And in fact, it was going to be so pervasive, so all-encompassing that he says it's like a little mustard seed. At first, it's easy to dismiss, doesn't look like much, but over time, it grows so big, it's bigger than all the other garden plants, so big that even the birds of the air can come rest in its branches. And I believe that's actually a a figure used to describe the nations coming together to find rest in Christ. The, the, the thing about the kingdom that the disciples and the religious leaders of Jesus' time, the, the kingdom that they wanted was actually too small. 
It didn't include all the peoples of the world. They just wanted a kingdom for themselves. Jesus wanted all the birds of the air to come rest in his branches. But in the short term, it looks like something you could very easily dismiss. So Jesus had resolve in the face of opposition to note because he knew who he was. He knew the task was not too big, that even in death, resurrection would come. And he knew that the enduring kingdom that he was coming to bring about was, was much greater than the hopes and dreams of those around him or the obstacles that he faced. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured all this. So Nehemiah and the workers, they had to have resolve. It says that they had a hammer in one hand and a weapon in another, that they were taking shifts, having to, to be on duty and guard themselves against opposition. They had to have the inner strength to face discouraging statements and to, to look around at their circumstances and not give in to the temptation to think, you know what, maybe this is too hard. They had to have that resolve. Jesus had to have even greater resolve and modeled that perfectly for us and calls us to the same. When he sent out as his disciples, he says, I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. Don't be surprised that if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. But blessed are you when you are persecuted because that's how they treated the prophets before you. That's how they treat your master. No servant is greater than his master. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. So don't be surprised at that. And in fact, pray for your enemies. Now, Nehemiah prays for his enemies. He prays that they would be, they would face the guilt of their sin. There's a place for God's justice in this. Uh, Romans 12 says, don't take revenge on those around you. Leave room for God's wrath. So there is a place for saying, I can have resolve because I know in the end, God will settle the matter for me. I don't need to take up uh, vengeance for myself. But the point be is that in general, it's important for us to see, yes, there's going to be opposition. Yes, there will be difficulty, but maintain the kind of resolve in our identity, in the, the, the confidence we can have that God will bring about his ends in his times, and that the nature of the work we're doing is effective, even if it doesn't look like it to the rest of the world. Paul tells his young mentor, his protege, his true son in the faith, he calls him Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, he says he's writing his instructions so that he can fight the battle well. Timothy's just a pastor in Ephesus, yet he's framing that up as conflict, as battle. Similarly, in Ephesians 6, the same place where Timothy was a pastor, he says in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the, the whole structure of power that exists in the universe. But we don't fight with weapons of this world. And it goes on to describe the armor of God, the way that we protect ourselves and fight against opposition with salvation, with righteousness, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We do not use the weapons of this world. We trust in God, and we trust the means He's given us as He builds His kingdom. Nehemiah encouraged the people, and he says, God will fight for us. We don't fight for ourselves. Yes, they were holding weapons. Yes, they were ready to defend themselves. But the idea is that their ultimate source of strength comes from the Lord. And so I want to encourage you in an attitude of dependence on God, in a, in a sense of, of, of surrendering to him. Like Nehemiah, in the face of a tangible opposition, his first instinct is to go to God in prayer. I was talking recently with a former student who is preparing to go overseas and be involved in, in church planning in a, in a foreign context. And during the season he's currently in, he's raising money and he's living with his brother and he's back at his home church. And he was telling me how he was feeling a little discouraged because he didn't like feeling like a burden. You know, he's in this in-between time. He doesn't feel like he's contributing much. And he, he, he says he feels like a burden. And I told him, you're getting an opportunity to get in touch with the reality of our entire existence. We are dependent on God. It's actually at the core of our entire message of faith, of the message of our faith, that we can't do it on our own. The gospel message is that we are powerless, that we could never do enough to earn God's approval, that we have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. But at the core of this message is, that's okay because of what God has done on our behalf in Christ. 
And so in the face of these challenges in Nehemiah, they're, more, they're given a very distinct opportunity to see that they need to depend on God. And in the case of this student, he's in a season where he acknowledges, I'm asking people for money. I'm sitting around waiting to go do something. I feel inadequate. I feel incapable. That is the reality all the time in our life. Whether we're smart, rich, successful, or whether it doesn't look like things are going well for us, at its core, our faith is a message of dependence, a message that we give up thinking that we could do it on our own. And like Nehemiah says, our God will fight for us. God has fought for us in the sending of his son. He has fought for us through facing death on our behalf and resurrection. He has fought for us in that he will come back someday to bring about justice, to bring about healing, and someday every tear will be wiped away. Every, every There will no longer be any death. In the meantime, we will face opposition. Let's not forget that the whole story of our faith spreading in the book of Acts was filled with the messengers of God being beaten, imprisoned, killed for this message. Maybe we don't see that in our current situation. Maybe someone out there listening to this does face that. Whatever the case, at its core, is a mess our message is we need God to fight for us. We need God to be our defender. We need God to be our savior in the face of everything we could ever deal with. But he is. Our God will fight for us. And so let's build a mind and heart and way of life that makes sense in light of the fact that God is our defender. Let's not try to take matters into our own hands. Let's not think that we can somehow achieve this without his help, and then maybe sometime we'll come back and talk to him about it. Let's have as our first instinct to call out in need, God, would you please help me in the face of this discouragement, in the face of this accus false accusations, in, this in the face of a denigration of the work I'm doing, God, would you help me? I invite you to have that kind of heart, that kind of mind that seeks to come to him first in desperate request for help in the face of opposition. <music>